Hi, Liberty lovers. It's so good to be here with you. I've met so many of you at the booth, and I hope to meet a few more of you after this. Um, the Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund works to make uh, the world safe for people that want to do direct trade with their local farmers. I don't know if you realize it or not, but the, in the last two decades, the United States Department of Agriculture says that the farmers' markets have increased 350% around the country. Also, CSAs, which are community-supported agriculture, uh, far, private farm buying clubs, food co-ops, farm stores, are seeing an exponential growth in, in sales. And we need to protect our rights. Um, unfortunately, this dramatic change in buying habits is making waves, and in some boats are getting swamped. Um, so I'd like to um, just go over with you some of the cases that we've been working on and some of the issues that we've been involved in. The Amish farmers in America have been fighting modern ways for two centuries. Although some of them have gone the way of conventional methods of farming, many of them have retained their traditional farming practices. Um, these farmers, uh, by and large, do not uh, have electricity, they're using horse-drawn plows, um, they actually graze their cattle on pasture instead of in factory farms. The, the um, conventional farmers among them are starting to see this trend of consumers wanting greater access to locally grown, very organically grown foods, and they're getting rid of the chemicals and they're going back to the traditional pasture grazing of animals, crop rotation, and this type of thing as the way of growing our food. We're not only seeing problems uh, with Food Safety Modernization Act that threatens these traditional farms, but we're seeing um, the local zoning boards interfering with the commerce between a local farmer and her neighbor. This is a picture of Martha Bonetta. She is a Virginia farmer who's now known as the property rights champion of our state. She was being harassed by her local zoning officials. They were uh, threatening her with fines, um, requiring uh, extraneous permits that, that her farm store, which was already licensed, did not need. And she had to work with the state legislature for two years to actually get a bill passed to protect uh, her right to farm. We, we are a right to farm state here in Virginia, but it took an act of the legislature to get this uh, county to back off and leave her alone. Um, she's now going to be honored by Country Woman Magazine in an upcoming issue as one of the 45 most influential women in agriculture in America, so we're very proud of her. She's also been granted the Liberty Hero Award by the Small Family Farm Foundation, and um, you know it just shows you that one woman can stand up and can make a difference. <laughs> She had a lot, a lot of support from liberty activists in our, in our uh, state of Virginia. Today I'm going to focus a lot on two foods that your federal government consider, considers very risky, uh, raw milk and raw oysters. I'm going to just show you some stories that will illustrate to you how when we let the federal government dictate what's safe to eat, how it can interfere with, with commerce. Please roll the tape. On the morning of April 20th, 2010, armed federal marshals and state troopers raided the farm of the Amish farmer who provided milk for my children. I felt powerless to do anything and angry that my farmer was subjected to a violent raid which jeopardized his safety and the safety of his children. The Amish do not use violence or force, so why does our government send in armed federal marshals and state troopers because a peaceful farmer is providing the wrong kind of milk? In 1984, the FDA banned the interstate transportation of raw milk. Raw milk became the only food for human consumption banned in interstate commerce. In March 2014, Congressman Thomas Massey from Kentucky introduced two bills to address and potentially overturn this ban. The first bill would lift the ban, allowing shipment of raw milk to all 50 states. The second bill would modify the ban, opening up commerce between two states that already allow for the sale of fresh, unpasteurized milk. While the bills introduced by Congressman Massey are not the end solution, they are a step in the right direction. You don't need to drink raw milk to support others' right to peacefully procure the foods of their choice from the producer of their choice. Please call your congressperson and ask them to support these two bills. Do it for peace. Do it for freedom. 
This is a patchwork of, of laws that we have operating on the state level around raw milk. And what's interesting to note that all the laws of raw milk are, are, are um, they are aimed at, at controlling the production. There's no state in America where it's illegal to procure farm fresh milk and drink it. It's only uh, the producer that gets um, managed by layers of regulations. Um, even in the states where it's legal to obtain raw milk, they control how many gallons you can sell in a certain time period. They control whether or not you can advertise. Usually you can't. Um, they also tell you how many cows you can own. It varies from state to state. But it's important to know that if you're in a state that totally disallows this food, you need to be able to cross state lines to get it. Um, and that's the kind of issue we work on. Ron Paul um, and the Campaign for Liberty have been very much at the forefront of this food rights issue. Ron Paul, when he ran for uh, president, was the only politician to address this. And he says that he would like you to be able to drink raw milk anytime you choose. So we're very grateful to his leadership on this issue. Um, there is a group of parents that are so concerned about what's going on that they started a uh, civil disobedience crusade called the Raw Milk Freedom Riders. And they decided to hold a raw milk and cookies party on the steps of the FDA a few years ago. They literally went... <laughs> They, they literally went and caravanned across state lines, bringing in raw milk from, from Pennsylvania to Maryland and through a party. There must have been 200 people, people from all over the country. Um, at that rally, I actually met a cheesemaker who the government had shut down because of the Rossum raid. Some of you know about the Rossum raid in Venice, California. She was there because her husband was driving a truck. They had had to shut down their very productive cheese plant in their in their farm and her husband was having to travel and drive a truck to make ends meet. Um, so anyway, th the one thing I wanted to point out to you, you'll see a lot of young people in these two pictures. There is a lot of interest by young people in these food issues, so if you're trying to grow your local Liberty Caucus, it's a very good thing to, uh, to appeal to the youth because uh, nobody can believe that they're not allowed to drink milk. It's such a wholesome, natural food are not, not allowed to drink it, but, but that it's make, being made hard to get, that's what I mean. Um, in the state of Maine, they've actually had 11 towns pass food sovereignty ordinances. What these ordinances do is they let a local producer selling to a local customer totally uh, avoid state and um, county regulations. Unfortunately, Dan Brown uh, was a raw dairy farmer and he was selling at a stall at the Blue Hill Farmers Market in Maine. And the State Department of Agriculture decided in, in spite of these ordinances to sue Dan. Uh, we had to go to court and represent Dan. He had a lot of support from his customers and the community. And of course, there was this ordinance protecting him. But unfortunately, as, uh, as often the case, the judge sided with the state against the farmer. So he's no longer allowed to have a stall at the farmer's market, and he's now looking for other, other ways to make a living for his family. The Raw Milk Freedom Riders rode again in Wisconsin at the trial of a farmer by the name of Vernon Hirschberger. Um, they took a seven-foot declaration of food independence to the county courthouse outside the trial, and they had a, a rally, and people signed, and, and once again, they, they, they drank the raw milk right there. Vernon Hirschberger's um, trial was very significant because he was charged with four counts uh, of d breaking the food and dairy code for a private buying club where his members actually worked in the store, they leased the cows from him, his members were actually owners in part of, of this farming enterprise. Fortunately, the jury saw uh, through our wonderful attorney's uh, arguments that he did not need government permits to do this type of, of, of private enterprise, strictly private enterprise. His farm store was not open to outsiders, for instance. So um, we believe that this is the first test case of our right to opt out of the government-controlled food supply by private contract. This is Kristen Canty, a mother from Massachusetts whose son was healed of severe allergies by adding farm fresh foods to his diet, including farm fresh milk. When she heard about all of the different actions the government were, was taking against farmers around the country, she got very alarmed and she raised uh, 
money, uh, borrowed money, and made a film called Farmageddon, which is now a critically acclaimed food documentary. We're actually selling it at our table. We don't have uh, too many copies with us, but you can order it at our, at our table. It's also available on Netflix, and it was, it was so acclaimed, this film was picked up by a major uh, film distributor, and it's going around the world. Um, in any event, she's done a lot to, to catalyze uh, interest on Capitol Hill about the issue. And we do have more support on the Hill than ever before for food freedom just because she captured the injustices going on. Senator Rand Paul in his book, Government Bullies, talks about food freedom issues. In fact, he's got a whole chapter called Public Enemy Number One, Amish Raw Milk. And um, he continues to be very involved in the uh, food issue. And recently he said, the FDA is using this new Food Safety Modernization Act to increase regulations of farmers to record levels and bring more and more businesses under its control. He says, we're just beginning to see the unintended consequences and regulatory overreach affecting farmers and food producers. All of this will drive up food prices while limiting consumer choices. And in fact, under this new Food Safety Modernization Act, the FDA recently came out with a, a regulation that even the, the benign bacteria in cheese, that they're going to put limits on that. And already, cheesemakers are having to take particular cheeses out of their production line because they don't meet that standard. Now, what we're talking about is a cheese with a bacteria that's health, healthful, or at least not harmful, and the FDA is getting down to that level of meddling in the food supply. So um, raw cheese makers have a lot of work to do to overcome this intervention. Now let's talk about oysters. This man you see here, his name is Anthony Bavuso. He actually lives in a zoning district in York County, Virginia, that's been historically agriculture since the beginning of our nation. Um, what's happened in his area is that the suburbs have sprawled, and now it's, it's a lot more residential than ever before. Um, but he's farming uh, ba basically oysters in his, ba in his backyard. And what's happened is the neighbors have filed petitions to get him to stop changing the character of their neighborhood. Now, who changed the character of the neighborhood, the urban sprawlers or the farmers? Um, so they are, uh, Anthony worked with our state legislature and he also succeeded in getting aquaculture put under the Right to Farm Act, which protected his farm. And do you know that these county officials are so bent on destroying his farm that they're now going to outzone that whole uh, 7,000 homes to end um, uh, the farming there. Um, they're going to take it and make it residential zoning. So. One farmer has already, uh, in, that, in that district, has already given up his attempt to get a permit for his backyard farm. Greg Garrett is actually a real estate broker, has a beautiful estate on the river there, and he started farming literally by accident. Um, he just started growing oysters for fun, and his neighbors wa were wild with them, and pretty soon he was, he was marketing them. And, you know, he's a real estate broker, not really a farmer, but because he had gone after uh, he tried to unseat somebody on one of the board of uh, on his board of supervisors. This is how this snowball happened. He got politically active, trying to unseat a, a, a person in an election, and that's the reason that Anthony's farm and all the other farms in that resident in that agri agricultural district may be outzoned. But when when Greg um, decided not to pursue his permit, he wrote a letter and he begged the county, please do not take away our historical you know, region of agriculture here. On the West Coast, we have a, a, another oyster case, which is a little different. Drake's Bay Oyster Company uh, is operating in a national park. It's a national, declared a national wilderness years ago by Congress in order to prevent development of this beautiful, pristine bay and the surrounding farmland. A number of ranchers are still ranching there. But unfortunately, the National Park Service, at the urging of environmentalists, has, is, has been trying to end the operation of this oyster farm. And in fact, they've been in a protracted battle for the last two and a half years. Um, in July 31st, the farm officially closed. But now the Marin County businesses that were dependent on this farm 
are suing because one, one restaurant alone is going to lose 400000 the first year. This whole little economy of this Inverness, uh, California area is dependent on this oyster farm. They produce at least 40%, perhaps even 50% of the oysters served in California. So they're a very big producer. They have a cannery that's already shut down. And I'm, I'm about to show you a film of Kevin Lenny, the owner, discussing this issue with his employees. And um, what you don't see in this film is he's telling the employees, I don't know where this is all going. If you have other job opportunities, um, it's up to you whether or not you want to pursue them. Would you please roll the tape? So we have this overwhelming support in, in our region, but that wasn't heard in Washington. So that's, that's the concern, you know? So we have, we have filed a lawsuit, okay? We're taking court action and we have lawyers. It's a special legal request that the court tells the National Park Service to wait. Wait until we're finished the lawsuit before you kick people out. This is our second house. Mm-hmm. Sí. Gracias. Ahorita tenemos triste, pero it's not finished. The Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund two weeks ago launched uh, our first ever Food Freedom Conference. We plan to make this an annual event uh, as a platform to make sure that you as the consumer will have the right and the ability to purchase the food of your choice from the producer of your choice without government interference. Um, at this event, we had Campaign for Liberty, Institute for Justice, we had the Canadian Constitution Foundation, uh, we had a, n a number of key activists from around the country, and we hope to grow this event. Um, it's, it's held in conjunction with a fundraiser at Polyface Farm, which Joel Salatin, as a member of ours, has gladly uh, held for us every year. Uh, our, our legal work is funded by donations and by memberships, and it's, it's an ongoing effort to raise the funds to make sure that these farmers are not unprotected. You know, when you were in grade school, you were probably taught that farmers have a very tough life. They have to fight weather, droughts, floods. They have to fight predators, pests. But today they have a more formidable foe than Mother Nature. They have the government on all levels, harassing them, giving them uh, onerous uh, paperwork and compliance uh, issues that they have to deal with. We do not want your farmer to go to court alone. This is a new hazard of farming. This is the reason a lot of young people are turned off to farming because it's just too tough, you know, it's just too tough. So this is a picture of one of our um, farmers in court with our attorney uh, drawn by um, a court reporter. I'd like to show you um, a little bit of our legislative work um, now. We also support grassroots lobbying efforts. Our attorneys um, advise about legislative language and this type of thing. Uh, we also work on the federal level, lobbying in Congress to help um, the raw milk bills that uh, Representative Thomas Massey is introducing, you know, two, two sessions Ron Paul introduced legislation to lift the interstate transportation ban and Thomas Massey is carrying on his work today. So I'd like to show you this video. Please run tape. My name is Sarah Donovan and I'm a lobbyist here in Washington, D.C. The Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund is the voice of the local food movement on Capitol Hill and in state houses around the country. The fund is solely devoted to breaking down the barriers between farmers and consumers and increasing access to nutrient-dense local foods. Every dollar donated to the fund goes to support farmers under siege from overzealous government regulators to protect your right to the food of your choice and to push food freedom legislation at the state and federal level. Please consider a donation to the Farm to Consumer and Legal Defense Fund. Thank you. We, we 
we do have administrative costs. We do have fundraising costs. We do have media relations costs in addition to the legal funds that we spend. But I do want to tell you that we have a lot of pro bono work being done on behalf of the farmers and consumers. We've actually had consumers' homes raided uh, by police for hosting a farm drop uh, in their garage. A, a, a cooperative effort to make it more convenient for neighbors to buy farm fresh foods, and they've been visited by the police. So it's very important um, that you know that in addition to the funds we raise, the membership dues that we collect, we have attorneys literally giving of their time pro bono to magnify and multiply the money that we're able to raise. And so we're very proud of the effectiveness of our efforts. Um, most of our paid attorneys are working at a fraction of what they normally would charge for other kinds of projects. So it is a very worthwhile cause, and we really appreciate your support and your time and attention here this morning. Thank you very much.